we're going to continue talking about overcoming a crisis. And today we're going to talk about prayer is obviously the most important key to overcoming a crisis. So we're in the process of going through five sections. And we talked already about we need to have a faith foundation before a crisis ever arrives, especially we need to be established in believing in full salvation and in operating in authority. Then um, today we're going to talk about prayer. And, you know, not only do we need to pray about and against the situation, but there are other qualities that we're going to need in order to be successful when we're in a crisis, especially if it's not an instantaneously resolved one. You know, if there's any time element, you know, for the for this to come to a conclusion, we're going to need some things that are going to help us along the way. So we'll start talking about that today. And then the other three will need to be strong and standing our ground. We'll need to do certain things to be able to remain steadfast in faith and not waver, especially, again, when things take a while to resolve. And then we may need faith reinforcements to kind of get us over the edge if we need to. Okay, so the first thing is we're going to talk about prayer of faith and authority. So last time we talked about authority, and we saw very clearly that there's so many scriptures in the Bible that declare that we have authority. You know, we are seated in a place of authority, in a position of authority above all things. Jesus has delegated authority to all disciples, um, to all believers. Um, we are born again. We are filled with the Spirit of God. Therefore, just by way of being born again, we have the authority of Christ because the Spirit of Christ dwells in us. So there's all these different angles from which we have authority, right? So we have the authority of Jesus Christ. Now we need to put it into practice. So the first requirement is that we have a faith foundation. We must know the promises of God. We must know God's good will. And when we do, that allows us to pray expectantly that he will answer our prayers. Expectation of answer prayers is faith. The prayers of hoping and wishing, generally, they're not effective. I'm not going to say prayers of hope and wish are never answered, but there's no promise in the Bible that says a wishful prayer will be answered. But there is a promise that prayers of faith will be answered. Amen? And so if we pray in faith, then yes, it shall be answered. And so God has promised to answer our prayers of faith when we pray for his promises and pray for his goodwill. The guaranteed answer is yes, if we believe and remain steadfast. And this is going to be important because the devil's going to try and talk us out of faith. You know, he'll try and bring symptoms back on somebody, you know, who's been feeling good. He may try and bring symptoms back on them to say, well, I guess I'm not healed. I better go to the doctor. I better have a surgery. I better take some medicine. I better do chemotherapy or something like that. You know, he'll have a, an expert tell you something to try and uh, produce doubt in you. You know, so we'll talk about steadfastness uh, later on, but this is going to be a critical part of our success is to be steadfast, especially in the face of contradictory evidence, contradictory words from so-called experts and medicine, science, and so forth. Amen? Okay, so we need to be believing. And if we are, and we remain steadfast, then we'll be greatly successful. We will be victorious. Okay, so these two passages here, um, they're just amazing. And so 2 Corinthians 1, 19 to 20 tells us that every promise of God, the answer is yes. Okay? For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So this, I mean, this is a crystal clear scripture, and it says, you know, Jesus isn't wishy-washy. You know, he doesn't desire for Kathy to be healed and Marlene to be healed, but Bobby and Marie to suffer. You know, he's not like that. He has the same goodwill for every one of us. You know, any any promise of God, the answer is yes. If somebody will know the promise, believe in the promise, speak the promise, and resist the devil. You know, if we do those things, then we will have it. Amen. It's promise. For all the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yes. Okay, and then we've talked about many times, but whenever you find the words will and shall in the Bible, then you found a promise. You know, believers lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. Okay, that's a promise. Um, believers will, will cast out demons. That's a promise. No evil shall befall you. Shall, that's a promise. Um, you know, so you can go on and on. No plague shall come near your dwelling. Shall is a promise. 
nothing shall by any means harm you, <laughs> shall is a promise. You know, so there's so many scriptures, and we just read over them, but every time you see that word will or shall, then think about 2 Corinthians 1, 19 to 20, because that means, you know what, this is something I can stand on. This is absolutely something I can stand on. He said, believers will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's a promise. I can stand on that. And so many other ones, right? And so it's a guaranteed yes, if you believe it, and if you, you know, speak your faith, if you operate in authority, if you resist the devil, then you are guaranteed a victory. Okay. And, and we'll talk about this some more, but, you know, the devil tries to weary us sometimes. And, you know, we're, we know the promises, we believe the promises, but if he can delay us and delay us by resisting us and keep delaying us, then we might just kind of give in at some point. And, and we don't want that to happen. So it's definitely going to be important that we have perseverance, that we have endurance, that we have strength. You know, hopefully all of our situations are, boom, just re resolved quickly, but it's, the reality is they're not always that way. And so we need that endurance to not back away from the promise. Amen. You have a promise. The answer is yes. Just don't move. Just be believing in it and stand fast in it. Okay. Then very much like second Corinthians, we have first John 5, 14 to 15. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him in father God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Okay, so this verse is even wider open than this one above it. Okay, so promises are a little bit more narrow than his will, right? So his will might be this big and his promises are like, you know, maybe a, a little less than that. So all of God's will maybe is not expressed directly in a promise, but much of it is. Okay, but then if you just know your father's good will, then you can pray for that and it will be done. And so what it means is we're praying for his desires. You know, like if you ask me to do something that I already desire to do, of course I'll do it. You know, if you want, you know, if you want some amazing dessert, of course I'll make a, a dessert. If you want some barbecued ribs, of course I'll make it because I, the, the desire of my heart is to do certain things. You know, if you want somebody to go on a Caribbean vacation, of course I'll go, right? Because the desire of my heart is I want to do these things. Well, when we know the desires of our father's heart and we ask him for these things, or we pray for those situations, pray in authority for those things, then the answer is yes. You, you don't have to twist his arm because it's already what he wants to do. So he wants us to be healed. He wants us to be free from oppression, free from poverty, free from sickness. He wants us to be victorious in life. He wants us to be successful and, and all these amazing things, right? So whether we think of things in terms of the promises of God or whether we think of things in terms of knowing his goodwill, you know, we are guaranteed answers when we pray for his promises or even looser than that, when we pray for his goodwill to be done, the answer is yes. We know, okay, that's confidence. We know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Okay, so these two scriptures like should put us on a mission. You know, I want to figure out all of God's goodwill because these are things I can pray for and it's a guaranteed answer. Amen. You can pray for things outside of his expressed will in the Bible and maybe it'll be answered, you know. I don't know. It just depends if it fits in with his desires or not. But um, there's so much like there's protection, there's provision, there's um, healing, there's walking in health, there's victory. There's so many aspects of his goodwill. And we want to know that, believe it and pray for that and remain steadfast. And then we're going to have a very rich prayer life and we'll have a great experience and we'll defeat whatever crisis may arise against us or against another person. Amen. Okay, so knowing the will of God, we then need to pray in authority, pray earnestly, praying the mountain-moving prayer of faith by speaking to the problem and commanding it, and then our prayers will be answered and they will avail much. We will overcome the crisis situation, okay? So consider the example of Elijah, who was an unborn-again person who prayed one time and shut off the rain for three and a half years, and that's an evil deed. Okay, so he, he prayed in faith for an evil deed, and the devil happily honored his prayer. Okay, then he prayed one time and brought back the rain. Okay, that's a good deed, so that's aligned with the will of God. Okay, so if an unborn-again person can pray in faith with one prayer effectiveness, 
to affect an entire population of people, then so much more are we equipped and able to do the same thing and greater things, given that we are born again, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we have the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen? So if an Old Testament person can be successful, I mean, think about it. It's one person. So one person prayed one prayer, and he affected an entire population of people. Okay, And then he prayed again. One person prayed one prayer and brought the rain back, and he affected an entire population of people. So just think about that. I mean, that's amazing faith, right? I mean, he had profound belief in order for that to happen. Just think about the, the life application of that. We have so many worldwide and country issues, city issues, corruption issues, fraud issues. There's all these big, huge community issues that are out there right now. And we have the power to influence those. We have the power to affect entire populations of people, whether it be our country, our city, our, our neighborhood, or, or whatever. So let us have this kind of faith. Amen. And so Elijah, he prayed effectively and he prayed fervently. So let's read in James chapter four, uh, chapter five, verse 14 to 18. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produces fruit. Okay, so notice that this is a promise here. It says, and the prayer of faith will, promise, save the sick. So if we pray in faith, there is a promise that they will be saved. They will be healed. The Lord, you know, Jesus, he will promise, raise them up. Okay, so the requirement here is that we be believing. Okay, so we're elders in the church, like we right here. We, we are elders in the church. We are elders in faith. We are elders in believing in Jesus. We, we do believe these things. We are elders in knowing God's good will. Amen. And so we pray the prayer of faith, which is Mark 11, 22 to 23, um, where we speak to the mountain. And when we pray the prayer of faith, the sick will promise be saved. Jesus, the Lord will promise, raise them up. Amen. I mean, that's really good news. Okay. And then this isn't limited to healing, but that's the example. And then he says, you know, the effective fervent prayer avails much. Okay, and we, we are righteous men and righteous women because our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. Now we are righteous. Now we are in right standing with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we were still in our sin, we were cut off from God. You know, we were separated from him. But now we are righteous men and women. Our sins have been washed away. We have been joined together with God. We are one with him, our Father. We are one with Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. We're anointed with the Holy Spirit. We're just like totally immersed and intertwined together with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we are absolutely righteous. Okay. And so what we need to do is we need to be in faith. We need to pray operating in authority like Mark eleven twenty two. And then we need to have some passion. We need to have fervency. So fervency is an important ingredient. And, and um, Elijah, he prayed earnestly. You know, he prayed fervently that it wouldn't rain. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a weak prayer, but it was a strong, passionate prayer. It was something that he desired in his heart, you know. And unfortunately, he did desire a bad thing to stop the rain and bring a drought. That's evil. Okay, so you can operate in faith in an evil direction. And then he later prayed and operated in faith in a godly direction. So we have to be careful because faith does work both directions. Okay, but let's look at this word fervent. Fervent, it means hot. It means hot in temper, vehement, vehement. Like it must be done. I am adamant. I am passionate that this person be healed. I am adamant that we'll get victory in this situation. You know, so there's a fervency, there's a fire, there's a motivation, there's a passion. And so that's what we need. And I think a lot of times we're lacking that, you know, we're like, we don't think of things in a proper context, like sickness, sickness is evil. You know, sickness will try to kill you. 
you know, the, the flu may start off semi, like not so bad, you know, somewhat innocent, you know, like, Oh, I don't think this is going to, you know, it's just going to pass, you know? And so you kind of maybe don't put as much attention on it as we should. And then, but it can turn into a killer if it's, you know, if the devil has the opportunity. So we need to just, we need to recognize all the works of the devil. We need to be passionate against those things. We need to be hot and temper against the devil in all of his work. Amen. We need to be fervent against a cold. We need to be fervent against a little pain in the finger. We need to be fervent against the deadly thing. So you have to be fervent towards even the small things to kill them before they have a chance to grow up and become a big deadly thing. Amen. So we can't wait for symptoms or sickness to blow out of proportion before we get angry. And we need to have some fervency when the issue we're facing is even in its infancy, we need to just crush it, you know, because the devil, sometimes he'll just attack somebody full on and they're just like having a, a very dire situation or many other times he'll just kind of like progressively bring something further and further and further and further upon you until, you know, you could have addressed it when it was just a little tiny thing. And now it's some big thing and you've accepted it for weeks at a time. And, and now it's, it's harder to get the victory. So we want to crush everything in its infancy. We want to recognize the works of the devil and we want to be angry about it. You know, if somebody, if there was a criminal, let's just say, um, let's just say you, you had your, your purse, you know, you're walking along and your purse is there and you have a credit card and I was, and your credit card's exposed. And I just kind of walk by and I snatch your credit card. Well, maybe you would be, you know, a little bit mad. Okay. But if I were to, you know, like break in your house and steal all your stuff, you would be extremely mad. And so, and so what we, we want to change that, you know, we want to be vehement and fervent against even the smaller crime. You know, the devil, he's just starting with something small sometimes, and then it's going to grow up into something big. So we need to be angry and hate the evil, no matter how small the evil deed is or how big the evil deed is. We need to recognize the works of the devil and come against them vehemently. Amen. Okay, so he says in Mark eleven twenty two to 24, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Okay, so we've talked about this many times in the past. So our faith will come from the Bible study that we've done on the promises of God and his goodwill, right? So healing, protection, walking in health, provision, prosperity, victory, all those things, right? So we, we already have that faith is established. So we have faith in God for sure. And then we speak to the problem and we tell the problem what to do. We command the problem, it says, be removed, be cast into the sea. And so those are commands. So whatever situation we're facing, talk, talk to the situation, not to God. You can thank God for his goodwill. You can thank Jesus that he suffered something to enable your victory. But then you turn your attention to the problem, to the devil who's behind it and to the problem. And you talk and you command and you speak with authority against the problem, against the situation, whatever it is. Okay. And then we have a responsibility to not doubt in our heart. Okay? And this can become challenging sometimes. So let's just say that, you know, you're praying, let's just say you're praying for healing. And then, you know, it's probably hard to find a family where every person is, you know, in faith, believing and divine healing and things like that. So there's always going to be some family member or friend who's a naysayer, a doubter, and they're going to like, oh, the, you know, I don't think your mom's going to make it this time. You know, we need to go ahead and plan the funeral. We need to do this. And they start talking all these doubtful things. Well, that can pull you out of faith, you know, so our battle, like we already believe, you know, we already have faith in God. We do. You know, we've seen so many miracles among us here. Um, we, we do believe in God. And so our challenge is not in the believing part. It's in not being pulled away by doubt. And, and that's what the devil's mission is. One of his missions is he's going to try and do things to make us doubt. And so we just need to be aware of his tactics we need to remain steadfast. And we're going to talk about a lot of things we can do later on to remain steadfast. Okay. So we need to war against doubt. You know, if doubt comes up, we need to immediately cast down those thoughts and reject them. And 
you know, if we believe what we say and we don't move away from what we've said, then we're going to have the good things that we have spoken. We will have the good things that we have commanded if we stay steadfast and don't enter into doubt. Okay. And he says it again, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So we'll talk about things that we need to do to, to keep believing. If something's not instant, then we may need to consume testimonies. And, you know, me personally, I just read testimony stories every day. And, and that just keeps you tuned up. You know, it keeps your faith tuned up. You're expecting God to do good things for you because you see, you know, as you're reading these short stories, you see the amazing things he's doing for other people. You know, so that's extremely helpful in just keeping your faith just um, strong, right? And especially if you're in a trial, then we need to, we're going to have to work extra hard to be believing while we're in the midst of that trial because circumstances may war against us, trying to make us doubt. Um, relatives may war against us. Experts, doctors, they, they may war against us. So the challenge will be not to doubt. The challenge will be to keep believing. So testimonies are going to help. You know, doing Bible study on whatever subject matter it is that you're dealing with in your problem is going to help. You know, talking and sharing stories with other believers is going to help. You know, so different things like that. And when we do that, then we will have whatever we say. Amen? Okay, then um, an example of this would be Acts 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Okay, so let's take a look. So first of all, we see that Paul prayed the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And so he prayed the mountain-moving prayer that Jesus described in Mark chapter 11. He spoke directly to the problem. He didn't ask Jesus. He didn't ask Father. He said directly to the problem. He said directly to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And so the, the Spirit obeyed his command because we have the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, so that's it's as simple as that. You know, that's how he dealt with the situation that he was facing. But also notice what it says. It says, Paul greatly annoyed. He was greatly annoyed. Okay, so what does that mean? That means he was, he was fervent. He was earnest about the situation. This, um, this spirit and this girl was driving him crazy, and he was passionate to get rid of this problem. You know, and I think, again, one of our problems is that we're, we're too passive. Like we accept sickness. We accept not feeling good. We accept um, annoyances or difficulties in life. We're accepting them and we're not recognizing them as evil and we're not, we're not passionate about it. You know, we've, we've come, we've become complacent and we accept and tolerate too many things just thinking it's normal. Well, it's normal to have a cold. You know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to worry about it. It's normal to get the flu. You know that so many things are normalized. No, it's not normal. It's evil. And I'm a son of God and you're not going to bring any evil upon me. And so even if you're trying to do a little evil to me or a big evil to me, I'm going to be annoyed. I am going to be earnest. I'm going to be fervent and I'm going to pray effectively and passionately. And my prayer will avail much and I will have the victory. And so be it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So um, we, we need, we need that fervency. We need the fervency, we need to pray in authority, we need to be believing, and we need to avoid doubt. And when we do that, we're going to have great success. Okay, so, so this is, you know, the, this page is kind of how you deal with the situation itself. You're going to be praying, operating in authority against the problem, against the situation. You know, that's how we're going to pray for that. But then there's other things that you want to pray for where you're really, you're asking God for certain things, right? You want to pray for your faith to be strong and not to fail. And this is, it's biblical to do that. So we're going to take a look at that. We know what faith qualities we need for victory, but perhaps we're falling short. What, what should we do? Pray and God will help you. In the example below, a father was struggling to believe. He was experiencing unbelief, or we could say doubt. He asked Jesus to help him overcome unbelief. 
We don't directly see what came of that request, but we can infer from the story of Simon Peter that Jesus would have helped him with his faith as Jesus prayed for Simon Peter's faith, and it was restored after he experienced a downturn. Okay, so let's read this in Mark chapter 9. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead. Many said, he is dead. Okay, so let's talk about this. So first of all, you know, let's take notice of what the devil's tactics were. And so what he was trying to do, the devil, sometimes he's going to try and put on a great show. And he wants to, he doesn't want you to be believing. And like these disciples, that he said, um, I brought your son to your disciples, like right here. So I spoke to your disciples and they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get the boy healed. Okay, well, the, the, the thing is that Satan was putting on a great show. And he was trying to produce doubt in the people. And so if you ever try to pray for somebody and they're like um, having a seizure and they're flopping around like a fish and they're foaming at the mouth and they're, they're gnashing their teeth and, and doing just dramatic things like that, it's, it's pretty hard to believe, you know, because I've experienced that and it's, it's shocking, you know, it's shocking because they look like they're going to die or something. And it, it is challenging to believe when the devil's putting on a show like that. And, and so that's what he did with the disciples. I mean, it's not written, but I, I promise you that's what happened. The reason I say that is because as soon as the father brought the boy to Jesus, what happened? Immediately, the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So the devil knew that Jesus was about to pray for the boy. And so what is the devil trying to do? He's trying to put on a show, invoke fear and doubt in the person who's going to do the praying. Amen. So if the spirit did that when Jesus was going to pray, then I can assure you he did the same thing when the disciples prayed for the boy. You know, so anything the devil can do to make you doubt, he's going to try and do it. One tactic is to have dramatic, you know, physical things happening like this. Other tactics would be, you know, this, you know, there was a crowd of people, the people came running together, and the devil loves to bring in people to try and produce doubt. You know, like for example, I've gone to the hospital and I'll be in a room getting, you know, talking to a patient, getting ready to pray for them. And then all of a sudden, like a whole team of doctors and nurses and like literally a team of people just come in the room. And what's, what's the devil doing? He's trying to produce doubt. You know, he's trying to create a distraction. He's trying to do anything he can to disrupt you and disrupt your faith. Amen. So even the disciples who were great in faith and had been successful in healing people, they failed with the boy. Jesus said they were faithless. So right here, he said, oh, faithless generation. And in the other version, in the Matthew version of the story, says, oh, faithless and perverse generation. And he's talking about his disciples among the other people as well. So his disciples who were great in faith historically in this particular situation, they did not have faith. Amen. It's because the devil was putting on a show. Okay, so Jesus said they were faithless. So that's the reason they failed. Okay, and, if, and, if, and if we fail, then that's going to be the primary reason. Either we, we weren't believing or we weren't persistent or we weren't passionate or we didn't resist the devil. There's you know, some combination of ingredients, but the key thing is you know, they were faithless and therefore they failed in this situation. 
So even after Jesus commanded the spirit to leave, the devil tried again to invoke fear and doubt with the appearance of death. Okay, so again, so after Jesus prayed, it says the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly. So he's still putting on a show. Okay, and then, then the spirit left and the boy became as one dead and people were thinking he's dead, right? So this would still be an opportunity to exit from faith and death could happen, right? So all through this situation here, you can see how the devil is warring against their ability to believe by the show that he's putting on. And, and he'll do that with you as well. He's done that with me plenty of times. And let me just tell an example. So it was like in the very beginning when I was learning about healing, there was, um, there was a guy that I went to go pray for. I think he had leukemia. I don't remember exactly, but in all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people I prayed for in hospitals, never in my life has somebody had like yellow police tape across the entrance to the hospital room. Man, I was like, oh my God, why do they have this? You know, you know, I'm talking about crime scene tape, like the caution, the yellow tape. They had it like a, a big X across the whole front of this guy's room. And, um, and it was to invoke fear in me. You know, I've never seen that ever again, ever in my life. And the devil did that to put on a show to scare me, to try and scare me out of faith. Amen. And so he'll do all kinds of crazy things like that. And another good example would be, we went to go pray for a girl who had been in a coma for a month and she had had a drug overdose and, and she was, you know, she was just still, but in a coma for a whole month. And then the day before I go to the hospital, she starts having seizures. And so they had to like tie, literally they tied her her arms and her feet to the corners of the bed because she was just flopping around like a fish, you know, just her head's going everywhere. Her eyes are rolling around spitting and everything's coming out and the, her whole body's just flopping like a fish. And so when we went to pray for her, like it was just a terrible thing. Her mother's like screaming and crying and begging God and, and the girl's flopping around. And, and I was just in shock, you know, looking at this, just like the disciples would have been in shock looking at this boy. Right. And so we prayed, and then I, I doubt if I had any faith at all when I prayed that prayer, just looking at all that and listening to what was going on and all the crying and begging and screaming and stuff. So we went downstairs, and we prayed, um, me and a lady that went with me, we went downstairs, and we prayed in agreement, not looking at all that stuff and not listening to all that crying and screaming and begging. So we prayed a second time. We prayed in authority. We prayed in faith because those things that produced doubt were removed from our presence. Right. And that's why, like Jesus, he, he's always trying to eliminate sources of doubt. So when he saw these people come running together, then he like hurried up and he went ahead and prayed. He didn't want all these people coming together uh, and having, you know, distractions or, or doubt or anything like that. You know, you'll, you'll see Jesus taking people out of the town to pray for them. You'll see Jesus kicking people out of the house. So what is he doing? He's separating himself from sources of doubt. Okay. And so what we did is we separated ourselves from looking at the girl and listening to the mom. And then we prayed. And the next day that girl woke up from a month long coma and she was healed. So thank you, Jesus. I mean, that's just amazing. She was a beautiful young girl. I think she was like 20, 21 years old, something like that. And by prayer of faith, the Lord raised her up. She was healed. She was set free after a month in a coma. Amen. Okay, so what we want to do is let us be aware of the devil's tactics when he's putting on a show or trying to distract you or trying to produce doubt and recognize them so that those tactics will not move us out of faith. Okay, If, if you're aware that that's what's going on, then you're going to be more steadfast in that situation. Satan will try to make your crisis as scary as possible with great theatrics to invoke doubt don't fall for his tricks, but recognize them and be strengthened instead. Okay, so the way you could think about it is, let's just say you go to pray for somebody and then crazy stuff starts happening. Rather than it invoking fear, think of it like this. Think of it like, oh, wow, <laughs> the devil, he's putting on a show because he knows I am about to crush and destroy him. He's trying to make me doubt. So you can actually draw strength from that. Because he knows he's got to do everything in his power to try and keep you from being in faith. So you, he knows that you are going to be victorious unless he can dissuade you. And so you can actually be strengthened by that. 
You're like, oh, look, look at what the devil's doing. He's making this girl have seizures right when I come to pray because he knows I'm about to kick his butt. Amen. And then you can, instead of, instead of his tactics producing fear in you, can actually produce confidence in you because he knows you're the greater than him. And that's why he's trying to do this thing. So you can actually be strengthened as opposed to being entering into fear. Amen. Okay, now let's look at um, Peter. So we're going to see Jesus praying for Peter's faith. So in Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. Okay, so first of all, I just want to clear up something because people think that the devil asked permission of Jesus and Jesus gave him permission to go torment Simon Peter. Okay, that's not true. Okay, we have to look up the definitions of the words. God doesn't give permission to the devil to do anything. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, not to give him permission. So God never, ever, ever, ever gives permission to the devil. Anything the devil does is against the, the will of God. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Okay, so let's just be crystal clear. This word that was unfortunately called asked in New King James, it was called desired in King James. So if you read King James, it would say, Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. Okay, that's a much more accurate translation than ask. Um, Jesus, do I have your permission to go destroy Simon? You know, that's, that's kind of how this reads to me, right? But it's not like that. This word translated as asked is exateomai, and this means to demand for trial, to desire. Okay, so the devil was demanding for trial. Um, he was demanding to afflict Simon with the trial, Simon Peter. Okay, well, what gives him the right to do that? Well, remember, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross, and before you're born again, you're in the devil's kingdom and authority. You are in the power of darkness. You are in the authority of darkness. So the devil, the God of this world, who had legal authority over mankind, can do whatever he wanted. Amen? And so he did. He did whatever he wanted. He sifted Peter like wheat, and he got Peter to deny Christ. Amen? And so his faith was rocked. And then even after Jesus went to the cross, his faith was still rocked for some time. But Jesus prayed for him that his faith would not fail. So it wasn't, Jesus didn't have an instantaneous answer to his prayer because you know, Simon, he was up here and like, oh, I would die for you. I would do anything for you. And then he denies Christ like three times and his, his faith, you know, he fell out of, out of faith. You know, he had a decline. And then after Jesus went to the cross, you know, he's probably going further down. So his faith is just withered away. Um, and But then it got strong and Peter became a great apostle. Amen. So Jesus's prayer did not have an immediate result, you know, but it did it did work. It just took some time. So Peter's faith declined. He denied Jesus multiple times. He was doubting and experiencing other issues after the cross when he saw you know, Jesus get killed. Um, but then he arose from that. You know, so he, he took a downturn after the prayer and went further down, yet still after the prayer. And then finally the prayer did its work and he arose out of that. Okay, so sometimes, sometimes there's a downturn after you pray before things get better. And we shouldn't lose heart and lose hope when that happens because it's it's actually pretty normal, you know, because the devil, he's going to try, he's going to try whatever he can to pull you out of faith. And as long as you remain steadfast and you don't budge from your prayer, you don't budge from the good words that you spoke, you don't budge from the promise of God. If you stay steadfast, then things will turn back around in your favor. Amen. So in the passage above, first of all, we see that it was the devil who was after Simon Peter. He desired him. He demanded him. Let us be clear that Jesus did not give permission, but rather the devil desired, demanded, and attacked Peter's faith. Peter was not born again. He was still in his sins. He was still in the kingdom of darkness under Satan's authority. You can read Colossians 1.13 and 14 for that. Okay. We see that Simon Peter was facing a faith crisis, and Jesus prayed for his faith. Things at first got worse, and then they got better. And then Peter ultimately became a mighty apostle who did great things for the kingdom of God. So take note of the order of things. The devil came to cause havoc. Then a crisis 
for Peter arose. Then Jesus prayed. Things got worse. Then perseverance and time um, took place. And then Peter overcame and became great. And so victory often follows a downturn of events. Okay, so just as just as prayer for Simon Peter's faith led to a great outcome, so will your prayer for your faith or for someone else's faith lead to great outcomes. So pray for your faith. Okay, so I, I'm like always praying um, to be pruned of any hindrances. I'm pr- I, I pray for to be steadfast in faith and movable from faith. I, I, and not just me, I pray for all of us you know, of Dominion Bible ministry for us to be steadfast in faith, immovable from faith. I pray for us to be believers in the full salvation of Jesus Christ. I pray for us to believe in the authority that has been given to us. I pray for us to believe in the Holy Spirit and his power and, and with knowledge and how to operate in him. Amen. So, so this is something I always pray about. And if you don't pray about your faith, I would encourage you to do so because it's biblical to pray for someone's faith, and then expect it to improve because Jesus prayed for Peter's faith and then it turned around and it became strong. Amen? So that's good news. Okay, so we'll we'll wrap up on this page. Um, So, and then we'll resume next time. So we want to pray for faith enhancing qualities. There are certain faith qualities that we will need in order to be victorious over the crisis. We'll need wisdom, vigilance, perseverance, unwavering will to win, victory mindset, and steadfast and movable faith. Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation that we've been praying about, yet we don't see positive movement. If we ask God for wisdom about the situation, he will give it, and that will enable our success. Okay, and let me just give a couple of examples here. So um, I mentioned this many times, but it's pretty recent. So last year, my mom, all of a sudden, she had heart failure, she had lung failure, and it looked like she was going to die. And we would pray, it would get better, it would get worse. We'd pray again, get better, get worse, pray again, get better, get worse. So it's like back and forth and back and forth. And there just wasn't forward progress. There would be, you know, a step forward and then a step or two back. And, you know, it was like that for, I don't remember how long it was. It was like at least a week or two, you know, it was back and forth and back and forth. And so I was becoming discouraged. And I was thinking that maybe, well, maybe she's going to go be with Jesus soon, you know, and I was, and you, I was starting to give in, right? And then, you know, then God gave us some wisdom. And the wisdom was we were praying for the wrong thing, because every time my dad would read the Bible or read a testimony story or pray, anytime he did something spiritual, all of a sudden the the machines would, uh, you know, the alarms would go off, the heart rate would change. The blood pressure would drop or go up that, you know, something would go wrong anytime he did something spiritual. So the wisdom that God gave us was that we weren't dealing with a, a sickness per se. We were dealing with a demon. And so my dad, you know, he was telling me this. He's like, you know, like every night when I do something spiritual, all of a sudden, all the beepers and buzzers go off and things just go straight to hell when I do something spiritual. I'm like, oh, my God, dad, that's a demon. And so then we prayed in, like we were prayed in strong faith after that because we knew exactly what the problem was, right? And so God gave us wisdom. It wasn't, it wasn't heart disease or lung disease. You know, those were the symptoms. Those were the manifestations of the spirit of infirmity that was attacking her. And as soon as we prayed against that spirit of infirmity, after we had that bit of wisdom and boom, like immediately, uh, everything just immediately started to improve. Amen. So it was phenomenal. So sometimes if you're in a stubborn situation, pray and ask God for wisdom and he will show you a better way or he will do something, give you some insight to strengthen you in faith. And it says in James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Okay. And so that's all you have to do. Just ask God, say, Father, I don't know how to deal with this situation other than what I've been doing. So I'm asking you, fill me with wisdom. What do I need to know to more effectively address this situation and get the victory? And he will give you the wisdom that you need because he loves you because you're his favorite child besides me. <laughs> you're his second favorite child. And, and he wants you to be victorious in life. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be victorious. He wants you to win in whatever crisis you're facing. And it is his, it is his goodwill for you to win. 
And so whatever you need, just ask him for it and he'll give it to you. Amen? He loves you. The Holy Spirit says that we need to be vigilant and steadfast in faith. Vigilance, vigilance means that we are watchful for the workings of the enemy, which should result in us taking immediate action to resist and destroy the works of the devil. We don't want the problem to progress. Rather, we want to destroy the problem in its infancy. Okay, and we already talked about this a bit, but well, let's just read, um, let's read this first and then we'll talk about it. In 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, the Holy Spirit says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Okay, so, and then vigilant. This word means be watchful, be attentive to discover and avoid danger. Okay, so we need to be on alert for evil. So, for example, when we talked about, you know, we, we just kind of, many people accept the common cold. Well, it's just a cold. And they, they don't even recognize it as evil. And so they accept it. They let it run its course. Oh, well, it's just the flu. They accept it. They let it run its course. Well, sometimes, you know, the devil will take advantage of that and he will escalate that common cold or the flu or something into, into something deadly. So we have to be vigilant. Like we can't just accept any working of the devil. We need to just crush and destroy every work of the devil, no matter how small it may appear right now, crush it in its infancy. So for example, you know, people don't just wake up one day and their whole body's filled with arthritis and they can't move. That doesn't happen. It, it starts one, one little joint at a time you, know, you get pain in this one, and then it gets to right here, and then it starts getting this. And over the course of weeks or months or years, it's just creeping up on, on somebody, and they've been accepting it all along because, it, well, it's just it's just this little pinky. It's just a, a little pain in this pinky right here. And so they accept it, and before they know it, then their, their body is filled with pain and immobility. They're like, how did this happen to me? Well, it happened because they weren't vigilant. They weren't vigilant. They didn't destroy that work of the devil when it was in the infancy in this little pinky finger. They accepted that. And then they accepted that. And then they accepted that. And then they accepted this and that and, and so forth. And it just crept up on them. And here they are. They're crippled. Right. And so we have to be careful about that. And that's just one example. But he'll try and do the same thing in, in any variety of aspects of, of your life. So we need to be vigilant. We need to recognize the works of the devil, and we need to crush them and destroy them in their infancy. We need to resist the devil with authority, with faith. We need to be steadfast in the faith. So this is the recipe for success. You know, the Holy Spirit's giving it to us right here. So we're going to talk a lot about steadfast in an upcoming teaching. Okay, but let us be vigilant. So as soon as you see an inkling of a problem, crush it. Okay. As soon as a doctor says the words, well, I think, um, I think that lump in your breast could be breast cancer. You got to crush and destroy those words. As soon as he says, I think we need to amputate this or that, or, or do this surgery or that or whatever, just as soon as that bad idea comes up, be vigilant and resist that cast it down, reject it, condemn, condemn those words that have come against you. Amen. So we have to be vigilant. And, and that means every time somebody speaks something like, if maybe you have a relative that's sick and, and there's, you know, you're in faith, but then there's people all around you. They're speaking garbage. Oh, well, I don't know if they're going to make it. And they're probably going to need a surgery. And I think they're going to need chemo. And, you know, people around you are talking like that. You can't just let those words just pass by because they're planting seeds in you. You're the person of faith. You're the one who has to remain steadfast because most of the people around you probably aren't believing the same way you are. And if you let them say all that junk, and you just let those words just sit there. Their words are seeds. They're planting seeds in you. And it may, you may just ignore them at first, but then they, you know, they start growing. And, and then before you know it, you're doubting. And before you know it, the person that you are trying to help is in trouble, right? Deeper trouble. So as soon as you hear people saying, speaking their doubts, speaking their fears, you need to be casting those things down. I, ideally, you want to condemn those words to their face and correct them. Um, at a minimum, you need to do it in your in your head, or you need to go privately and reject those things. But you can't just let them sit there. Amen. When you have a crisis situation, do not let people speak failure over the situation without condemning those words. Amen. We have to be vigilant. Okay. Number seven. 
Sometimes situations take time to resolve, in which case we need a will to win and perseverance to stay in the fight. Remember that the crisis you are in is actually warfare from the devil against you and against the kingdom of God. We need to be spiritually violent and continuously resist the devil. We should remain prayerful to God and authoritative towards the devil and the crisis situation. Okay, so we need to be spiritually violent. We need to recognize the evil and we need to violently come against it. And we need to be adamant that the promise of God belongs to me and nobody's going to take it away from me. Amen. We have to just claim uh, all of God's goodwill, all of the great and precious promises of God, all of the full salvation of Jesus Christ. We need to claim that and just be violent. You will not take away my health. You will not take away my prosperity. You will not bring harm upon me. We need to be adamant in that. We need to be spiritually violent when the enemy comes to try and take something away from us and bring a crisis upon us. We need to be violent against that, spiritually violent. Okay, and Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And well, he's not talking about physical violence because we know Jesus said that um, the kingdom of God does not fight, right? The kingdom of God does not fight. The kingdom of God does not participate in physical, you know, bloody violence. That's not from God, okay? He's not telling us that, but it's a spiritual violence. We need to be spiritually violent and authoritative and persistent against the devil and against his works. You know, sometimes we, we love it when we pray once and the situation is done, but then sometimes there's, we need persistence and we always need authority and we need to always be spiritually violent and just destroy evil whenever it rises up. Okay. And if we do that, you know, we're, we're guaranteed a life of victory. Now, our identity in, in Christ is that we are victorious sons and daughters of God. And Romans 8, 35 to 37 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Okay, so any crisis situation that you could be facing, it fits in this scripture. You know, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, you know, poverty, peril, danger, sword, violence, war, rioting. You know, any situation you're facing, it fits in this passage. But guess what? In all these things, you you will conquer. Amen. You will conquer through Jesus Christ who loves you. <laughs> Amen. That's good news. This is a guarantee right here. This is a guarantee. You are guaranteed to conquer that situation. You're guaranteed. And we just need to learn how to fight. Amen. We need to learn how to fight. We need to believe. We need to exercise our authority. We need to be spiritually violent. And we will conquer and destroy the devil we will make him think, you know, 10 times before he ever comes against us again. We will crush him and destroy him. Amen. So we need to, um, we need to be steadfast. In Luke 18, 1 to 8, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Okay, so we there's two major qualities, a couple of qualities here that we see. We say that we need to pray, pray always. You know, don't lose heart. So if you're in a, a situation that's taking a long time, don't stop praying about it. You know, don't lose heart. Recognize that not everything happens instantaneously. You know, Jesus prayed for Peter's faith, yet he went through a terrible downturn. And, and it took some time after that downturn, but then he came up and rose up out of the situation, right? So there was, there was, I don't know how much time it was, but there was a significant amount of time for that situation to turn around, okay? And 
whatever we're facing, whether it's a health related thing, a financial thing, relationship thing, whatever's going on, just don't lose heart. You know, so pray and ask God to fill you with endurance. Pray and ask God to strengthen you in perseverance. Pray that he will strengthen you with an unwavering will to win. And this is an important one. If maybe somebody is sick, you know, like if somebody's suffering cancer, at some point they just, they probably just want to give up. You know, like I've, I've had enough suffering. I just want to go upstairs, you know, and, and we don't want that. We don't want the devil to murder us and take us out. We want to have an unwavering will to win. So if a problem comes, we don't just give into it and let the devil have his way. Now we want a will to win that will not waver so that we will resist as long as necessary, endure and persevere as long as necessary until we conquer and destroy that work of the devil. Amen. So pray for these qualities, pray for wisdom, pray to be strengthened with vigilance, perseverance, unwavering will to win, pray, you know, to, to be strengthened in a victory mindset, steadfast, immovable faith, pray for these qualities. Amen. And get other people to pray for the same things for you. And it's going to help you. This is one of our biggest problems is losing heart, like in the midst of a, a battle, right? We can lose heart. We can lose heart about our marriage. We can lose heart about our health. We can lose heart about a financial situation, you know, and we don't want that to happen. But here we can see what happened is this, this widow, she was persistent and insistent. She wasn't going to throw in the towel. She wasn't going to give in. And so it took some time though, because she was continually coming, um, lest by her continual coming, she weary me. So this ungodly judge, the enemy here, the enemy I guess there's two enemies. The judge wasn't um, wasn't her advocate, and then she had an enemy she was trying to get justice from. So she's really dealing with two enemies here. Um, and it took some time. It took perseverance, but but she got the victory because of her persistence. Amen. Okay. And then it goes on to say that um, God will avenge His own elect. Right? He's going to avenge us, and He will avenge us speedily. So you can set your faith on this is going to take a long time, which we don't want to do that. Or you can set your faith on, you know, I want what Jesus said. He said, Father God will avenge me speedily. And so we want to be believing in that. We want to believe in a rapid resolution of the situation. Amen. So try and get as much from the word of God as you can. You you want to get the victory, first of all. Some things may take time, but let us just set our faith, faith on speedily. Let us push for that. Let us believe in that. And then it's going to accelerate our answers. Amen. Okay. And then Jesus also says, you know, am I going to find faith on the earth? And so in order for any of this to work, we have to be believing. We have to not lose heart and be pulled out of faith in the midst of it. We have to not lose heart and be pulled out of prayer and operation and authority in the midst of it. We have to not lose heart and be pulled into doubt in the midst of it. Amen. All right, so I want to wrap up there. So pray for these different qualities here. You know, if you have a situation, and even if you don't have a situation, it's good to have to be strong in all these areas, be filled with all, wisdom for all aspects of of faith life, of life. You know, God, fill me with your wisdom in every aspect of my life, so that I deal with things effectively and efficiently. You know, and so forth. So God will answer your prayers. God wants you to be strong. We have the example of Jesus praying for Peter's faith. If Jesus can pray for Peter's faith, you can pray for your faith. You can pray for the faith of the people around you that are dealing with crisis. And then everyone's going to be raised up in victory. Amen. And then next time we'll talk about, we need to pray for righteous indignation and fervency. This is a a big missing ingredient, I believe. And we need to pray for boldness and courage. We're going to have to stand our ground We're going to have to contend with doctors and nurses. We're going to have to contend with unbelieving relatives and friends. We're going to have to contend with worldly experts and and people like that. So we need boldness and courage. It's going to be extremely important to have the victory to be bold and confront people and cast down and condemn the words that they're speaking. And then we'll also talk about we need to pray to be pruned of any hindrances. All right. So that's what's coming up. Uh, Any comments or questions?